Each of us has a unique career story to tell. For some, these fly high like rocket launches. For others, they're more like the game of shoots and ladders with advances and setbacks along the way. Either way, we learn countless lessons from these experiences. And that's what we put into the spotlight here at Career Sessions Career Lessons. Join discussions featuring a variety of guests sharing their stories of ups and downs, as well as the secrets of their success and what drives them to continue moving forward. We break down the tools and resources that will help you establish your dream career and realize your professional goals. Here's your host, J.R. Lowry. Hi, I'm J.R. Lowry, and this is Career Sessions, Career Lessons, which is brought to you by Pathwise.io. Pathwise is dedicated to helping you be the best professional you can be, providing a mix of career and leadership coaching, courses, content, and community. Basic membership is free, so visit Pathwise and join today. Today, my guest is Saf Yaboa Amankwa. Saf is Senior Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer at Intel Corporation. He leads Intel's corporate strategy and ventures group, focused on driving growth-oriented strategies, including strategic partnerships, Intel Capital, equity investments, and incubation initiatives. Saf joined Intel in 2020 from McKinsey & Company, where he was a senior partner and global head of the transformation practice for the telecom, media, and technology practice. Prior to that role, he served as managing partner for South Africa and head of McKinsey's telecom, media, technology, and digital practice for Africa, among other roles. Saf holds bachelor's and master's degrees in electrical engineering and computer science from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He's a current board member of the United Negro College Fund, the Department of Defense Business Board, and Mobileye. Saf, welcome. It's been a really long time. It'll be fun to catch up. It's been a minute, so looking forward to it. It's been uh, probably about 18 years more than a minute, but we'll, we'll call it a minute. Um, so you were at McKinsey a lot longer than I was. You joined Intel a little over three years ago. So tell us about your current role. You know, and by the way, thank you for inviting me to this thing. So I um, do four, three or four things at Intel. Um, and I, you know, report to, to the CEO, um, Pat Gelsinger, who is an amazing human being who was at Intel 30 years, did many, many things, left for 10 years and is now back driving the transformation. But I do four things for the company. One, I lead corporate strategy. And it's a classic corporate strategy team. We do um, portfolio work. We do special projects. We look at, you know, sort of our M&A pipeline and agenda. We do a lot of work looking at benchmarking, look at the TAM. So basically kind of try and look around three, four, five years from now, whether or not the company is well positioned or not. The second thing I do is I run Intel Capital. So we have Intel essentially started the corporate venture capital um, in tech. And so we've been investing for quite a long time, 25 years. But what we do is we invest mostly in series A and series B and C type. And, and we look at both things that are, you know, sort of ecosystem things, so not necessarily related to Intel, but also things that Intel cares about in terms of driving the ecosystem. Okay. And what we try and do is um, be the eyes and ears for the company, but also we try and make money. Right, so we we try and generate cash and cash returns, and we've actually done quite well the last, you know, five seven years, and and so I run that. We invest between three hundred and half a billion dollars a year, three hundred million to half a billion dollars a year, and um, wow, we do that. Yeah, so it's one of the largest. Um, uh, and we invest in about four domains, and we you know we we have about twenty five to thirty invest you know professionals as part of the team, so that takes up quite a bit of my time. The other thing I do is I actually run um, three businesses for the company. So as part of the portfolio work that I do, I do a lot of restructuring, um, resetting, and incubation. And so right now, there are about four or five businesses that are under my watch. One is the auto business unit, which we've been you know, turning around. So it's, a, you know, it's about half a billion dollar business that we think should be much larger. And I can talk about that you know, in a second and later on. The, the, I also run the silicon photonics business. Um, again, it's a business that we think is very strategic, that we are, uh, you know, I'm working to, to transform from pivoted from one business model to other. I also have a sensors business, um, and a, a sensors and robotics business that we're incubating. So I manage that. I also run, we have a, the corporate partnership and alliances team that reports mm. to me. So, you know, with M&A really tough and also how diverse our portfolio is, we found that doing 
partnership and alliances can sometimes be really effective at accelerating our business model um, inorganically. And so I have a very small but mighty team that look at pretty big team, big partnership opportunities that kind of are not really M&A, they're not really, um, you know, sort of procurement. It's a real partnership and it takes, really requires a lot of creativity. And so I have that team as well. And then I have a few other small teams, but those are the four main things I do. So as I mentioned, you, you'd been at McKinsey for a really long time. How did this opportunity arise and what, yeah. you led, what led you to decide to make the jump after so long in consulting? Yeah, it's interesting. So Intel was a client of mine when I was in McKinsey. It hadn't been a client for seven, eight years, because if you remember, I moved to Africa to, to lead our, our South Africa practice for a while. And um, But before that, I'd served Intel pretty intimately. So I knew the company. I knew the culture. In fact, I often used to tell my McKinsey friends, there's this one company of all the companies that I'd served that I'd be excited to go work for on one day would be Intel because the culture yeah. just, just worked for me. I'm a geek at heart, you know, as you know, I'm an electrical engineer. And so I thought, and the work that, you know, the, the, the company was doing was it's always exciting. So when I came back from Africa, like many people, I was getting to a milestone age and, you know, it's two, three years from being 50 years old. And I was like, I got to do something different. I can't be at McKinsey my whole life, right? But at that point, I'd been at McKinsey 24 years and had, you know, done you know, almost everything that I could do at McKinsey. And um, I'd come back to North America and I felt that I had another two or three more, you know, runs at me, in me. And I wanted to do something different. McKinsey, as you know, um, well, JR is the only company I'd ever worked for, right? I left MIT and came straight to consulting, been here for 24 years and felt like before I start thinking about retirement, you know, five, seven years down the line, I kind of wanted to do a couple of things different. And so I got a call from the CEO. A couple of the board members had uh, mentioned me as that he was thinking about kind of upgrading his team or kind of getting some more strategic help. The lady that was doing the strategy team, an amazing woman called Aisha Evans, had left to go to run Zooks, which is an autonomous um, car company. And she was also a client of mine. So she also recommended me. And so he called and it took a while, but eventually I was like, you know, yeah, be part of hopefully biggest transformations in a tech sector. And so that's kind of how that got me got me into Intel. So I, I guess knowing the culture, was it a big shock for you, kind of switching from consulting into the corporate world, or because you knew the company so well, not not so much? You know, it it was a big shock, but it wasn't as blunt and difficult as I um, expected. Yeah. Um, Knowing the company, also knew a lot of people in the company who were my old clients. You know, most people at Intel are usually there 25, 30 years. So a lot of the people, most senior people, I actually knew from my past as a consultant. Um, but having said that, it was a big shock. I mean, you know, uh, you know, you were McKinsey, I, I, you know, dealing with budgets, HR issues, right? Yeah. You know, I had to spend a lot of time rationalizing a lot of portfolio and, you know, firing people, doing you know, tough, tough, um, you know, CPMs having to deal with, you know, not just being an advisor, but actually a principal negotiating deals for, for the first um, year and a half. I also had the m and team reporting to me and I did a bunch of, you know, deals, which are totally all consuming, um, oh, yeah. type transactions and then also kind of running businesses. So it was a, you know, the way I like to think about it, it was like playing with live ammo. Mm. Uh, and you know, when the first shot comes over your head, you know it's a bit, it's a bit. Uh, so that part for me was was jarring. You know, after th after six or six nine months, I I kind of got my sea legs, um, and I kind of felt comfortable. I think the other thing that really helped was that most of the top team were new because Pat came in, but even before Pat came in, there had been another CEO and a lot of changes, and so. You know, they, when I joined, most of the people in the senior team were kind of new to their roles. So it wasn't like I was joining a really well-formed oiled machine. We we're all kind of figuring out our new jobs together. And so right. in some ways that really helped. But, but the transition from being an advisor, although, you know, as you remember, I did a lot of transformation work at, at, mm -hmm. at McKinsey, right? So a lot of, you know, massive three-year type programs where you become quasi- you know, sort of operational with the client. Right. And so I'd seen it, but having to live it as a principal was a was a whole new um, game. 
Yeah, you certainly feel it more. I mean, I've been through those experiences a few times and it's the people part of it, right? Like when you're in a consulting role, you're a step removed from it. When you're the manager who's having to, you know, tell somebody somebody that they've lost their job or you're even if you're in a more senior position and you're looking at the list of people who are going to be losing their jobs. I mean, it's a hard thing. Yeah, and it never gets easy. Um, I think what you realize very quickly, what I realized was that you got to treat people as adults mm. and you got to be fully transparent. You got to be very transparent about the economic and the strategic rationale. People respond well to that. I think you get into trouble when you, you know, you try and spin things, right? That's, yeah. That, I've seen people make that mistake. Yeah. Um, and that does not end well. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's generally been my approach as well, just to, to be straight with people. I mean, it, it, we're certainly far enough into the era of layoffs, right? They've been going on for decades, you know, probably since the eighties that all of us, you know, no matter how old we are, we've kind of grown up in this environment where it's just a part of business and you just have to accept that you were in the wrong place at the wrong time and not take it overly personally and move on. Exactly. And and on the flip side, you know, when you're the one having to deliver that message, as you say, you got to just treat people with respect and treat them like adults and let them get on with their lives. I totally agree. So talk about the transformation that you guys are going through at Intel. We call it IDM 2.0, right? So IDM, if you remember, from, an, from a semiconductor perspective, is when you, you design and make your own chips, right? Mm -hmm. Don't interact with the world. In, that's been Intel's heritage. What we realized um, when you know we did the a lot of work when Pat came back in was we had a fundamental fork in the road to make. Right, Intel was the IDM model still sustainable. Right, you know, most of the IDMs over the last twenty years have exited manufacturing and given all of their manufacturing to TSMC or to Global Foundries or somebody else. You know, right. AMD famously split the company into two, and so on. Based upon all the work and thinking that we did, we realized that actually the path for Intel was not only to be a great manufacturing design company making chips, but also to be the world's um, number two to chasing to be the number one manufacturing capacity, both manufacturing technology and manufacturing capacity going forward, and to create a really credible Western alternative um, to TSMC from a manufacturing perspective. For many different reasons, this was the most, you know, all the work that we did, this was strategically the most important path, the only real path we had to create shareholder value. And that change of trying to not only win in terms of technology, but capacity is a massive shift in strategy for the company, because it means that we also can't just manufacture for ourselves, we need to be able to manufacture for others, and hence 2.0, i.e. we also created a foundry inside Intel. Foundry, i.e. a contract manufacturer for semiconductors for third parties. And so we've been on a journey to both restore our leadership on the product design and product side, right? Sort of for the PC, the chips for the PCs, chips for servers, chips for, you know, edge, edge compute. But we've also been on a journey to not only re-catch up with TSMC and Samsung in terms of manufacturing technology, but also be on a path to build leadership capacity on par with what TSMC is offering for leading note, um, for, you know, for advanced um, manufacturing. That's a massive transformation on multiple different levels. On the, on the product side, there's a huge transformation in terms of the way we design chips and the, the moving to a chiplet world. It also means a fundamentally different cost structure for operating the business. On the manufacturing side, it also means really accelerating the path of innovation for manufacturing technology in order to be able to catch up. We call it five nodes in four years, unprecedented activity. And also, you know, we've committed to spend over $100 billion over the next five to seven years to build next generation capacity, to be able to offer, to be able to really catch up and create a, a leading capacity for the industry. So that's huge, you know, bold aspiration and, you know, huge transformation the way in which we are locating our capital. Is anybody else who's a who's a designer doing doing what you guys are doing in terms of contract manufacturing? So Samsung does is, you know, 10 years ago, Samsung moved in this direction. But the amount of sort of contract manufacturing they do is pretty small. 
Um, they have you know very few customers, and in terms of capacity to to match the demand and also match TSMC, they are they are you know nowhere near that. So Samsung is the only real you know other company that has has tried to go down this path. How far into it are you guys? So we, you know, Pat came three years ago. So he came seven weeks after I came. So I, I, I joked that I hired him. Hmm. Um, and we have been on this journey since he got here. We spent about three, four months once he came. It's just kind of, he had this strategy already in his mind, but we had to tune it and make sure that, um, you know, we could get the whole organization on board. And we've been on that journey since. And hence the Chips Act and hence the Arizona Ohio announcements, as well as our announcements in Germany. It also speaks to quite a number of the announcements we've been making around packaging and bringing, you know, customers on board to to Intel Foundry. One of the questions I wanted to ask you certainly was, you know, with all of the kind of supply chain disruptions that we've seen over the last few years in particular, right, be it from COVID or, you know, just concerns about leaving manufacturing in places like China or, you know, the supply chain issues caused by just shipping, you know, I mean, we're seeing this a bit right now in the Red Sea. We've seen it with the Suez Canal, the Panama Canal is having issues, you know, so the shipping industry's had its moments as well. How does that leave you guys in terms of how you're thinking about where you want your footprint to be? You know, it's, it's funny. We, we spend a lot of time on this topic, as you can imagine, this whole yeah. topic, resilient supply chain. And not only resilient supply chain of our supply chain, but our suppliers' supply chain. Exactly. So we, we spend a you know you'd be surprised how a twenty dollar filter, a two dollar filter can stop the whole you know twenty thirty billion dollar factory, right? So the short story is, the industry spent twenty five years moving to optimizing for cost and just in time, and the industry did an amazing job. Right, so every single part of the value chain has been optimized for cost and just in time um, supply, which is me, which has meant, you know, for certain chemicals and certain supplies aggregating in China, for certain, you know, manufacturing in Philippines, for certain um, specialities in in Germany or in um, Amsterdam, and the industry is really optimized, you know, for scale and scope. The, the reality of COVID and the reality of the geopolitics is that, that the, we have to add another optimization lever, which is resilience, which means that we have to find a way to ensure that, that the, our supply chain, the industry supply chain, can withstand shocks similar to what we saw in COVID. Because it's very clear with all of the dynamics in geopolitics, but by the way, it's not just um, China. Is, you know, we have this issue in, you know, with Israel. Israel is a pretty sure. big part of our supply chain. Um, so was you know, um, Ukraine and Russia in terms of talents, you know, talent supply chain, as is Latin America and so on and so forth. And so what we've en 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 embarked on for the last two years is dissecting every part of our supply chain and um, understanding what our supply concentration is, what's the cost to and time to replicate in a different geography or with a different supplier. What is the path to actually be able to qualify second and third type suppliers and so on and so forth. And we've gone through the supply chain and done, you know, basically created as much resilience as possible. What you can imagine is that there are segments of it that are very difficult to create resilience on, right? Chemicals from China. There's certain chemicals that are only processed in China. 90% controlled in China. There are certain manufacturing, by the way, of our customers that is only either in China or in Taiwan, right? A lot of the assembly is in that part of the world. Right. Obviously, huge amount of money, huge amount of time to try and create resilience. And so you have to think about what you do about it. And so there's a lot of work going on to, to figure out whether or not you can stockpile this. So huge amount of work that is going on to try and create some shock, shock absorbers to the supply chain. Some of it, honestly, we don't think it's solvable by us alone or even by the industry. It requires support mm. from the government and requires huge amount of investment that we as an industry need to figure out how we, how we put down. I know you're involved in the Defense Business Board. I would imagine that that's a central theme for them too, because that's, you know, ultimately parts of this really get at national security. Yeah, I mean, you know, 
if you take Taiwan for a minute, right? I mean, this is all, you know, I mean, the, the, I think the reckoning was during COVID when, um, because of the supply chain issues, you can get cars out, you can get planes out, you can, I mean, it literally can bring the whole global economy to a pretty big halt. Uh, imagine if Apple and Microsoft and, and, and Amazon can't scale the uh, right. data center capacity because they can't get servers. They can't get servers because the chips that, maybe not even the CPU, maybe just the, the memory controller, right, that is being manufactured in Taiwan can 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 make it and all of a sudden you're stuck, right? So it's a very important um, issue and hence you see all of the dynamics with, with the CHIPS Act, with the puts and takes between the US government and the Chinese government. And you mm -hmm. see the, the push for most of the suppliers, most of the end customers in terms of the OEMs to really push hard around, hey, what are we gonna do to create you know, alternatives or to create um, you know, secondary suppliers just in case there's disruptions in the supply chain. Switching gears, you, you mentioned earlier that you, there's, I think you said there were four areas that you look at investing in in your venture capital arm. What are those areas and you know, what are some of the interesting things that you're seeing from the investments that you've made? Sure. So we care a lot about the enterprise IT industry um, because we historically, Intel has always felt that that is an, a segment that is a big driver of our demand of our supply, if you will. And so any all technology associated with, with enterprise, we look at to invest. And that could be in software, that could be in storage, that could be in security, that could be in, you know, you name it, but all around enterprise technology. The other area we invest in is in cloud, cloud infrastructure particularly. And when we say infrastructure is not just hardware, but also software, and you know management um, of basically cloud infrastructure. Obviously, AI has become a very big part. AI infrastructure has become a very big part of that. But but not only. The third area we spend a lot of time on, broadly speaking, is what I'd call manufacturing technology. So there is a lot of innovation going on in chemicals. A lot of innovation going on in tools for silicon designers. There's a lot of innovation going on in next generation substrates, next generation machinery um, for, for different aspects of, of semiconductor supply chain. Lots of innovation going on in packaging. Um, so we spend, we, you know, we care a lot, obviously, about the resilience and, and sustainability of that part of the ecosystem. So we invest a lot in that. And then the fourth area that we, we spend a lot of time on is broadly speaking, I'd say, um, um, software where we try and put money into up and down the value chain, because you know what we found with our Microsoft partnerships and with all the other sort of partnerships is that you know, software drives hardware. Um, mm. People say that software eats hardware, but software also drives a ton of hardware. And so one of the things as being the eyes and ears for the company is understanding what's going on in workloads and what's going on and driving, that is driving you know, developers what's driving um, application and ISVs. And so we spend, we invest in that um, segment as well to ensure that, first of all, they're usually good returns. Um, second of all, they give us good view in terms of what um, developers care about. You know, with the things that you're investing in, how common is it that you end up incorporating them into the core of the business versus they just end up, you know, kind of remaining an investment that you've made? That's a great question. We go back we've gone back and done an analysis on this and i would say that overall it's it's actually not as big as you would think so less than 15 percent of the companies that we invest in at intel capital end up becoming intel assets yeah but but there's some not notable ones that have become Intel assets, right? So there's quite a number of the AI companies we invested in that are now part of the Intel uh, business. But there's but it's that is actually quite unusual. What we typically do, however, is um, we do a lot of partnerships with the portfolio companies in terms of them we investing, doing sort of you know NRE collaboration. We co-sell, right? We allow them to use our sales engine to accelerate their business. 
we a lot of the time these are companies that are you know very complementary to what we're doing or helping to solve problems that our customers care about so we bring them to our customers the most successful examples is when they become public and we we have they are using our infrastructure our technology and they are kind of references or pooling uh, intel with them and those are actually probably more the norm there are some notable ones where we've purchased and sometimes that you know obviously you know my investment team is very sequestered from the rest of intel they've focused on alpha right and my interventions is very much on the domains they should invest in and the way in which they should invest and sometimes we use them as leverage to help the business units understand the segments that they're investing in but their main objective is to generate alpha and then bring the lessons from what they're doing into the company as as uh, on a sort of on a pull um, push basis i've sort of seen it from both sides when i was at fidelity and i was not involved in the investing activity that they were doing in terms of venture capital they very much ran a venture capital arm almost as a completely standalone thing at one point it was like actually i think spun out uh, from the, the traditional company go over to state street where you know we didn't do a whole lot of investing in the way that you're describing you know it was all really things that we saw potentially becoming part of our business either a technology or some services play and in some ways we actually didn't really care so much about the return uh, on the investment itself i mean obviously we didn't want to throw money away but we were more doing it to kind of keep a pulse on what was going on out there that might be interesting in our business. So, you know, every company kind of does it a little bit differently. You guys, I mean, if you're investing three to $500 million a year, I mean, that's a massive scale. And we've returned three, or three times our money, you know, for the last three, obviously this year has been tough, but mm. the last three, four years before that, the returns, the cash and cash returns have been incredible. I mean, obviously they're not Sequoia level when they were at their peak. But, you know, three, three and a half times cash on cash with that's pretty good strategic benefit is is nothing to sneeze at. No, definitely. How do you in the core company, how do you create that culture of innovation that's so important in tech? Yeah, I mean, it's I'd say it's not easy. Um, I think there are three or four different elements that I think standing back, you know, almost as a consultant and looking at the company culturally, you know, I can point to the first is there is an arrogance maybe arrogance is a is a not in a pejorative but in a in a cultural sense that intel should be solving the most difficult problems in our industry right there's yeah. a there's a there's a belief set there's a there's an ownership based upon our heritage based upon intel cap in intel labs um all the things that we've done in the past in terms of inventions right so intel invented wi-fi intel invented you know, USB, Intel, there's many things that Intel has invented for the industry, right? And right. so there's this, you know, heritage and belief set that we are, you know, we are stewards of the industry in terms of, of um, innovation. And that that goes a long way in terms of mindset, in terms of aspiration, um, in terms of interactions with, with others. So, so that's a very big thing. The second thing that I think drives our culture is that we are, we reward and incent um, people who are contrarian and who come up with things that may actually not have any commercial benefit, but there's a there's, but we're culturally very comfortable with those people walking around. We have these people called uh, special engineers, and and um, I forget the actual title they have, but these are people that kind of roam around the company. It's like a hundred of them. They don't really have any real accountability, except if you put them in a job with accountability. But if they don't, i.e. be your CTO or run an engineering team, but they don't have to. And yeah. their main job is to look for problems that are important for the company, to describe them, and then to you know create a team to go attack it. And sometimes they borrow, beg and steal. Sometimes they go get money from the, from the corporation. But these leaders, these hundred or so folks are, you have to be incredibly, I mean, Pat is, is one of these people, right? You have to be voted by your peers that you can become this type of person. And then all of a sudden you have latitude um, to do some, you know, whatever you think is important for the company. And they roam around. I have one or two of them in my organization and yeah. they are quasi CTO, but they don't have to be, but 
but they are the they are the technical um brains of the company very very important and even with all the cost reduction and so on and so forth we've been you know it's almost sacrosanct to to cut yeah. these people right so that's that's a very important part of the culture and we reward in order for you to become you know um, a fellow we call them Intel fellows you have to be you know done something amazing and they are they also create they also have the ability to challenge anything right because they're not really accountable from a PNL or they're not they, they, they don't have they have total job security these folks can they will challenge anything I mean they'll challenge the CEO they are totally not afraid to challenge they're not business people they're very technical um you know sort of innovation type people I think the third thing that drives innovation in the company is that we're incredibly there's a culture of paranoia right you know Andy Grove famously said famously you know sort of coined this term that only the only the paranoid survive and so yeah. there's a real sometimes to our own detriment of total paranoia around secrets around benchmarking around trying to understand you know we're always afraid somebody's going to kill us right so there's a and and that drives innovation right so you know it's not good enough for it to be this way it needs to we need to get to this Moore's law right we need to keep driving this thing because you know otherwise the, somebody's going you know the water is going to to come over us so those aspects of the culture really drive both the focus on big problems you know the audacity to that intel should be the one to solve them and then you know set a talent in the organization that you know can do it right can put a team together to go address it now that has its negatives right so in none of those things that i say that there was business innovation right so there is no you know there is we don't have um fellows that are business fellows if you will that are kind of thinking hard about whether or not we should change the business model or you know we don't have people who are up you know obsessing about customer experience mm. or the engineer experience or the you know in, in in ways that other companies do right so there is there's there's real strengths but there's things that we think we can improve on how does that translate into the kind of people that you look to hire what do you look for in them you know we're 140,000 people so um you know we we have a lot we, of hiring <laughs> it's a lot of, so our head of HR is busy. Her team is very busy. And, you know, we hire factories, we have for engineering, we have software, we hire a sales team, we have a big sales team. And so, but but I'll say that I think if you're asking the question at the executive level, right? So the, the management level, um, I mean, in the sort of the working level is very clear, right? We're looking for talent, but we also very interestingly, very comfortable and very biased towards what I'd call um, talent that is, you know, non-conventional talent. We hire a lot from um, from people going to, you know, going to school part-time or going mm -hmm. to community college. We found great talent in community colleges, people who are technical community colleges. We do a lot of work um, ourselves creating curriculum for different colleges to train our people, to train people that we'll hire. So we invest at the sort of the the first line, if you will, or the engineering teams, a lot of money to create talent that is for Intel. Uh, lots we spend a lot of time on that. At the executive level, you know, when we're looking for talent, when I say executive level, you know, sort of three or four levels below the CEO, a, mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of things we're looking for engineering people with a very strong engineering background. You know, Intel is a very engineering driven company. Even the way we present. Um, material in a business setting is very engineering centric right it's in some ways it's a bit like McKinsey it's very fact-based it's very um it's all about facts and charts and you know benchmarks and so on and so forth and that's that's how we make decisions and that's how at least that's how we think we make decisions actually that's not the case but but the culture is very much for you to survive you need to you need to really embrace this sort of very engineering centric way of communicating so we look for that uh, when we we're hiring executives so you could have gone and done many other things but having that engineering um, backbone is very important let's switch to to some topics in tech we won't get to my sure. full list but we have to start with ai sure so what are some of the things that you find particularly exciting about the way that ai is unfolding in the world in terms of excitement 
I would say the things that blow my mind away. Right. So the, so you asked the question in the pre pre stuff. Am I a bull or a bear? Yeah. Um, I'd say I'm a long term bull. Okay. Um, I think we are literally at the beginning stages of how AI is going to change our world, right? In some ways, I think about it like early 90s when you had Yahoo and Hotmail and AOL and so on and so forth. That's where we are right now, right? Yeah, people are just, it's first order stuff, right? And that honestly is is not going to be that value creating. It is value creating in the sense that we created AOL, Yahoo was created, Hotmails, but they don't exist anymore because the delta in terms of value creation was not significant, right? I think what got what was really significant, especially in the mobile internet, was things like you know e trade and eBay, and then you had um, things like Uber and and things like Airbnb, things that fundamentally economically are so disruptive and could never have existed before um, the mobile internet. I think that is when you create a ton of value. And I don't think we're there yet with AI. Mm. We're just at the beginning stage where we're talking about first order type impact. When we get to second, third order type impact, where you're actually, you know, sort of splitting apart, you know, creating an Amazon business model, only because you can have, you know, such transparency in terms of using um, the internet. That's when, you know, the music industry totally transforming. We're not, we don't, we're not there yet. Right. And so that's what I'm saying, but we're going to get there. I, it's just hard for me to predict, but when we get there, I think it's going to be amazing. The places where we kind of have gotten there already are things like autonomous driving. It is, I don't know if you've had the opportunity to sit in one of the mobilized cars or no. where you can experience L4 driving. So we used to own, we own mobile 90% and recently spun them off. And, you know, we, I went to Israel to, uh, for a board meeting and they picked me up at the airport and they drove me from, from the airport to Jerusalem, to the streets. And, and if you've been to Israel before, you know, it's like driving in Cairo or driving in Lagos or driving in, you know, Mexico City, right? People, you know, rules are just, the, the, the rules are just suggestions, right? And right. Um, level four driving all the way, the guy did not touch the, the the wheel except to point in the directions we're going to go and this car kind of figured it out including how to edge yourself into a circle everything and that is only possible because of ai mm-hmm. and ai has transformed the idea of, sec- of safety the, the idea of autonomous driving in, in in many ways for me that is an example of a bull um you know what we're going to see leveraging ai um, that we've not seen yet. And so for me, those things like um, auto- automation, especially in, in robotics and in automobiles, are the things that are super exciting. Other things that are very exciting are like, I don't know if you've seen video search using um, LLMs or you've seen, you know, pe- you know use people using AI to create videos, um, you know, so right. deep fakes and so on and so forth. It is just mind boggling to me how compelling and difficult to spot the difference it is and Don't you guys run an ad campaign saying you can spot the differences though we can <laughs> we can that's the that's the really cool thing we you know we we have the uh, antidote um, we can actually figure it out but but that stuff for me is very compelling it's all the stuff that everybody right now is talking about in terms of this the, the scale of the large language models and the text-based sort of prediction stuff that you see with chat gtp and so on and so forth yeah. Those are pretty com- pretty cool. I mean, I, we've also seen quite a lot of performance improvement with writing software. That's pretty cool in terms of uh, all of those things. I think those are, you know, sort of um, generation A1 or sort of first order things. And yeah, that is fantastic. I mean, you know, we would love to get 25, 50% productivity from our software designers by using, you know, sort of a co-pilot or a, a tool yeah. and so of course we're going down that path but i think we are five years from the disruption of search um, you know search is i don't know 180 billion dollar business for google right now um, imagine that being disrupted right i think those things are the things that i'm excited about you know seeing not that i want google to be disrupted but 
those are the things that I, I'm just, I think I'm a long-term bull on. Does that make you a short-term bear or just not sure? I think it's overhyped. I'm short-term overhyped, right? So it, I think it's a little bit overhyped right now. The hype is over, is, is too high for the current value creation on the ground. But I think the industry will grow into the valuations. I guess, you know, I just wonder what's the economic impact of this, right? In terms of, you know, I mean, if it makes your software developers 20 or 30 or 40 or 50% more productive, that's great. As long as, you know, you keep hiring the same number of them, right? If it makes them more productive and then you need fewer of them and you do that on a massive scale, you know, it, it could end up being disruptive in a different way. And it, it's hard, hard to say. You know, we've had lots of change. You and I have watched them in our adult lives, right? You know, you mentioned some of them, you know, just the internet and mobile phones and all the things that have been, you know, by and large, massive positives in the scheme of things. You know, you go back to manufacturing, moving overseas or automation, taking away jobs. And, you know, those are the things that are tougher. And it's a little bit hard to know where robotics and AI, you know, AI specifically are going to play out in terms of that kind of continuum, if you think about it that way. No, I agree. And I think, and that's why I'm, I say that in the first, the first order is what everybody's looking at right now, which is, hey, essentially, I'm going to stop hiring people and just hire AI bots to do my work for me, especially white collar work. That's a first order thing. That's interesting. It's like having a, a, a bot to help your call center agents answer questions, right? So I get that. Yeah. I think the places where the AI will make a huge difference, frankly, you know, it's hard to predict, but there are in places like healthcare, I mean, let's take yeah. healthcare a minute, right? So we have a business, a small incubation business that allows, can take pictures of you even now, and we can, we can tell your, your heart rate and your, whether or not you're having problems with breathing or something's wrong with your eyes. And we can combine it with actual readings. And we can, you know, sort of democratize, um, you know, AI has the potential to really democratize a lot of the very sophisticated sensing that happens in the West and make it widely available across yeah. the globe. We have a technology that can watch you move, walk, and tell whether or not your recovery from a knee operation is going well or not or whether or not you have a, a problem that needs surgery, or you can watch a baby to tell whether or not you, should, you need to bring the baby in because it's breathing. I mean, so all these things where, you know, sort of take a NICU and make it, you know, take it out of the, the NICU and make it much more available. I think those things using AI for me are, could be truly compelling and transformational. Yeah. Um, and we are only at the beginning stages. One of the biggest constraints is data to train these models, right? I'll give you an example. One of the things that we've been trying to train our models on for, you know, we have this business that allows for people doing rehab. It can give you a lot of very good, you know, using a, a sense of very good feedback upon your performance. One of the big challenges is, you, you know, it turns out you can't just train it on, you know, you know white men in New York. You have to, you know, Chinese bodies are slightly differently. African bodies are slightly differently. And yeah. so you have to get, you know, mix, you have to get a broad set of um, data to train these models on. And one of the things that, you know, we you, you have to figure out how do you do is how do you do that, right? In a way that makes these models effective globally. So those are some of the things that we're struggling with or we're wrestling with. Uh, what about quantum computing? I think very early stages. Uh, we have a lot of you know research and work going on in our labs. The potential benefits are pretty substantial. the The technical challenge to be able to get that done is is non trivial, and we you know, we're trying, right? I mean, as part of my portfolio work at Intel, it's it's in my what is it, my my bottom left box. Yeah, so it's in there, and we we dabbling in it, but I don't think it's ready for prime time yet. Yeah. What about time travel? Yeah. <laughs> like time, on time travel? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, um, look, the physics is interesting, right? That's how I think about it. But I don't think we have so much more headroom in terms of 
innovation before we get we we get there. Yeah, that was a joke question anyway, Saf. Um, did did you go to the consumer electronics show? Yeah, I went to CES. Um, yeah, mostly a lot of meetings. I I walked the halls two or three times. I got to tell you the the thing that is really clear to clear and clear every time I go to see it. I mean, this is the second time I've been is how the auto industry is just totally computers on wheels. Right. I mean, it is, it, you know, the transformation happening in the auto industry is breathtaking. Yeah. Um, they've clear. really been, I mean, they've kind of gone kicking and screaming into it. If you go back 20 years ago, and, you know, I think it was really just the, I don't, I don't know whether it, it was the sort of rise of the battery powered vehicles or whether it came before that, but I mean, it's gone completely the other, uh, the other way. I mean, it is a pretty incredible what you get in a car these days. It's breathtaking. And part of it is the Chinese OEMs have really shown the world Tesla. Yeah. I mean, Tesla shown it, but everybody's like, yeah, it's just Tesla. And now the Chinese OEMs are, you know, like BYD and Zika are really showing that, Hey, if you if you think about it like as a computer on wheels, it's a you can be so disruptive and and as you said, the others have been you know they're 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 finally you know getting there, but they're getting there in a difficult way, right? I mean, it's it's not um, their natural instinct, but that industry will be unrecognizable five years from now. Yeah, I mean, it's it's unrecognizable relative to you know I think about when I was a kid, you know, and car had a carburetor you know you, you could actually it was it was a mechanical a mechanical thing right uh you know now and you can't do anything in terms of figuring out how to fix a car without a computer hooked up to it getting diagnostic data and right. it's you know the old days of like you know machining parts and fixing cars and you know is, is all, i mean that's that is the it's like having a sewing machine <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know those still I mean, exist though well yeah we still have you know porsche other people who have um those I mean, they just be hundred and fifty thousand dollars each right and difficult yeah. but but you know you go to china i was in china about six months ago and you see the innovation happening in the auto industry and what you, you can you know of course highly subsidized by the government and so on and so forth but it is astounding uh when you yeah. when you you know it's pretty cool so i think for me yeah. that that's what I took away that the, you know, the acceleration of the, of the auto. It says something that the auto manufacturers are even at the consumer electronics show. Yes. That would not have happened 20 years ago. Absolutely. And they have their own wing. They have their own, I mean, it's, yeah, it just says a lot. I mean, to be honest, yeah. the other consumer electronics stuff, you know, because mobile is largely kind of flat, a lot of stuff on TVs, like there's this transparent TV from Samsung. It's interesting. Mm. It's a bit gimmicky, but interesting. I, I, you know, there's a lot of sort of robots for cleaning and robe, you know, sort of in the house robots yeah. activities going on. But in terms of real sort of, you know, the way you and I think about from our training at McKinsey around innovation in terms of, you know, value creation or value destruction, the other yeah. one is just out of control. Yeah. We're going to run out of time. So two last yeah. questions over the years, what are the strengths that you've relied on again and again? And what are the things you've really had to work at developing? It's a great question. I, and I thought about it a lot when you, when I read it, I'll say, look, you know, my training as an engineer and at McKinsey really built my analytical skills, right? I, I think that is a strength that I've relied on a ton, right? How do you disaggregate, put stuff back together? Seven steps right. of problem solving. How do you create an issue tree and do it in your head and analyze and bring it together? How do you be, you know, to ask the right questions because you have the issue tree in your head. That training from being an engineer to being a McKinsey consultant, frankly, is a, is a skill that, or capability, a muscle that I rely on all the time. I think the piece that I've had to work on um, and is frankly what I now rely on more than my analytical skills, frankly, is um, what I would call the EQ part. Being able to really listen when people are talking and meeting and really understand how they're feeling 
trying to get in tune with what people are feeling to really understand um, what is motivating them, how they're going to make a decision. Because even in a place like Intel, they're highly engineering driven. 99% of all the decisions are emotional, are all EQ driven versus IQ. Because when it comes down to it, it's about how people feel, what they're afraid of, what they're excited about, um, who they trust, who they don't trust, how experiences they've had in the past that have scarred them and, and therefore leading yeah. them to one decision versus the other. And so the muscle, the capability that I've really had to work on, right, is not the IQ stuff, the analytics stuff, but it's really getting you know much better at listening and really tuning in on the EQ side. I, I talk about to my team all the time that, you know, when you're talking to people, when you're presenting, when you're trying to compel people, you always got to think about how they're going to present it to their boss and how they're going to feel doing that and make sure you tune into that rather than the logic that you're trying to persuade them with. For me, that's been, that's been the thing that I've worked on the most. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting that you talk about how much of the decision making is driven by that in a place like Intel, right, which is a very engineering centric company. I mean, imagine what you would be saying if you worked in, you know, something that's much less technical. Ralph, we'll say Ralph Lauren. Fashion. fashion. <laughs> <laughs> what do you what do you when you think back wish that you'd known when you were fresh out of MIT? You know, I think the, the the one thing that I wish I'd known is how how precious it is to build and maintain your networks. The networks that you build when you are 22, 23 to 35, 36, the people you meet who are all going to go do, you know, try and change the world in their own way are right. pretty, pretty important. And what I found when I was at McKinsey, and I don't know if it was the case with you, with your business school buddies or your undergrad buddies, is that you get a bit tunneled into, you know, the work, right? And, yeah. you know, you don't spend enough time kind of coming up for air and, you know, kind of learning what others are doing and staying in touch and building their network. Uh, because it's, first of all, it's fun. And second of all, as you get older and as you get more mature, it is it is much more fun to have had a broad network to get advice to to do yeah. things and 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 for me that's that's the the I've done I've, I've corrected it over the last you know you know few years but I wish if I had to do it all again I think I would have I would have done more of that yeah I mean I think I had you know when you do all those projects right and you work with so many different companies and in different industries you develop a very eclectic network right um from your time at McKinsey. I mean, LinkedIn didn't exist when I was at McKinsey. I left before LinkedIn uh, was rolled out. That but dates I mean, you. at this that really dates you. I know. Well, a lot of things date me these days, Saf. But, you know, if you think about like, there's zero excuse not to stay up with a network, especially now, you know, that we've got all these social media outlets for doing it. And, but it, it, I mean, it's more than that. Obviously, it's, you know, I mean, the, however many thousand people you're connected to on LinkedIn, you obviously don't know them all equally well. And, you know, finding a way to sort of supplement the, you know, mass scan that you can do by looking at your social media feed with, you know, catch ups or, you know, running into people at industry conferences. And I'm sure you found it's a lot different when you, you know, when you go really deep in an industry as you have now, you know, you start to develop a much deeper industry network than you, you get even if you're doing a lot of work in that industry, you know, as a McKinsey person, it's just, it's just different. Um, yeah, they they totally both, different. you know, sort of pre and post, you know, or at McKinsey, post McKinsey have both been good in their own way, but you develop very different networks. And, but it, no matter what, it really does matter. That's for sure. I have to say the, the McKinsey network has been very special. Uh, even, you know, I've never, I've, you know, I've incredibly, I've really appreciated the McKinsey network post leaving the firm. Um, yeah, the the readiness of everybody to pick up the phone and help that's been pretty cool. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I wasn't there nearly as long as you were, but you know, when you when you've been at McKinsey, you're a partner, you know, and you say you were a partner at McKinsey. I mean, you've got even if you weren't a partner, if you were just you know an engagement manager, didn't stay quite as long. You've got credibility with people. They'll they'll generally take your call, right? They'll give you 15 minutes of their time and they'll try and help. And that's 
that part of that network has definitely been very good over the years. Yeah. So, we'll all right. I know we're, we're probably past time, so I appreciate you doing this. And no worries uh, at all. yeah, it was good to catch up. We'll have to maybe not wait 18 years this time. Yeah, I know. Next time I'm in London, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely uh, drop you a note. Yeah, that'd be great. Cause it's pretty rare for me to get to Washington DC. So <laughs> I'd love to catch up in person. All right, boss. All right. Thanks, Saf. Cheers. I want to thank Saf for joining me today to discuss his role at Intel, some of the exciting advancements in technology, uh, and a little bit about his own career journey as well. If you'd like to make the most of your career, visit pathwise.io. You can become a member. Basic membership is free. You can also sign up on the website for our newsletter. Follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok. Thanks. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to Career Sessions, Career Lessons. We hope the nuggets of wisdom shared today help guide your path to the successful career of your dreams. This podcast series is part of Pathwise.io, which is here to help you live the career you want. We provide a comprehensive mix of career and professional development events, insights, tools, and exercises backed by a group of leading coaches and other career management experts. If you aspire to something more or just something different in your career, join us at pathwise.io. You can find us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. See you again on the next episode.